just a quick introduction. For this, for this month, we're really focused in on Micah 6, 8. And the idea is, uh, God has said, I have shown you, O oh man, what is good. You know, a lot of people have that question. What is good? What does God require? He says, I've shown you, O oh man, what is good, and this is what I require, that you act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Now, last week, we, we dealt with the, the idea of justice, and we're going to spend the next two weeks on mercy. And what I get to do right now is introduce you to Talon Gaskins. He's been working with me since May, really excited to have him on. And uh, mercy's definitely been on the mind. It's something we've both been thinking about. And today, he's going to start uh, talking about this uh, in the idea of how mercy is found in the image of God. Uh, Talon's a a man after God's own heart. He, he wants to share the word of God. He has a passion for it. I uh, really encourage you to open your Bibles, open your ears and hearts to what he has to say now. And if you're listening online, uh, Talon wants to preach. And if you need a preacher, give me a call. Uh, we, can, we can work something out there in, in the future. Uh, so that's what's going on today. Really excited again to see everybody here. Uh, hope you're encouraged uh, by our time together. Good morning. I'd invite you to open your Bible or your Bible to 2 Kings chapter 6. Go ahead and just leave your finger there for a little bit. Uh, we'll get into that in a minute. And while you're turning there, um, I really just want to take the, a second to thank Josh and to thank the elders for letting me have this Sunday uh, to preach um, until I get to do this for real. It's really nice to practice. And I was going to make a joke about a lot of people showing up here when I get up here, but uh, I think here in a couple of weeks we're going to have a lesson on humility, so I'm just going to leave that joke to the side. Um, this morning, I want to talk about the image of God and how it was in humanity. And specifically, I want to talk about three major characteristics that God placed inside humanity when he created man. And the first of those characteristics is mercy. And this fits right in to our topic right now of Micah 6, 8, to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly before God. And in this sermon that I'm going to present to you today, there's two more parts of it that maybe I'll get to deliver later on. And in those other two parts, I want to talk about the commitment and the courage that God has placed inside of us. The word for, for commitment is actually pistis in the Greek, and it also means faith. Faith and commitment are the same thing, actually. But we'll get to that later on because today I really want to capitalize on mercy and how God has placed mercy within us. Our text again, Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, oh man, what is good. But what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? He has shown you what is good. And today we're going to specifically look at how God has shown us how to love mercy. Mercy, And to do that, let's go all the way back to the beginning. Let's go back to the creation of man. Because in the beginning, when God created man, in Genesis chapter 1, 26 and 27, he says this. Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. When God says here, let us make man in our image, I don't necessarily think that means like theomorphically. We, aren't, we don't have physical characteristics like God has characteristics. And I think we can spend a lot of time talking about that. And there's some fair argument for that. And God definitely uses the rest of scripture to communicate with us so that we can relate to him through physical characteristics, him putting his hand over Moses in the cleft of the rock or his ear being big enough to hear us. But here, image is really just in representation of God. And same thing with likeness. Likeness is with the characteristics of God. Because as we see in this passage here, after likeness, he says, let them have dominion. Where does dominion come from? It comes from God. And he took that dominion that he already had, and he placed it on humanity. And he gave them the responsibility to watch over the garden, to watch over the earth. That characteristic came from him, and this is also how we understand where we get like our emotions and our personality. We understand joy, because the same way that God experiences joy, he placed that inside humanity. The same way that we experience sorrow, God experiences sorrow. Anger, God experiences anger. So we understand those emotions because they came from him. And so this is also where we get our big characteristic 
of mercy. All the way in the beginning, when God created humanity, he gave them the ability to comprehend mercy. The same way that he can exercise mercy, he gave us the ability to exercise mercy. And not only did he give it to us, it was his expectation that we do that very thing also. This right here, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, is the very first place that we also understand where God shows us mercy. After the creation of man, as we move further into the creation narrative, we then come into the fall of humanity in Genesis chapter 3. And at the fall, the very first sin of man, God comes down and confronts the sin, and he confronts all three parties that are involved, the serpent, the woman, and the man here. And as God is dealing out the cursing to the serpent in chapter 3, he says this in verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And you're probably wondering, like, what does this have to do with mercy? This passage right here has a really big word that I want to share with you, and it's protoevangelium. You can take that to Thanksgiving, share that with your family so they think you're really intelligent, or that you've been listening in church, maybe. This passage right here, the seed story, or the protoevangelium, is actually the very first representation of Jesus Christ. All the way back in the Old Testament, God uh, recognizes the sin that's happened, and then he immediately delivers the solution for it. And this is how it is. Um, the seed of the woman here is speaking of her offspring, that someday one of her offspring will crush the head of the serpent. But just before that crushing blow, the serpent will strike at the heel of the one whose foot he will be under. This is the first symbol of Jesus who will put Satan under his foot and crush him in the victory of the cross. And I consulted uh, who um, I think is a very intelligent commenter on the Bible, James R. Fassett, to better explain this, he says, when God is speaking about thou shalt bruise his heel, the serpent wounds the heel that crushes him. And so Satan would be permitted to afflict the humanity of Christ and bring suffering and persecution to his people. And when he says, he shall bruise thy head, the serpent's poison has actually lodged in the head, and a bruise to that part is fatal. Thus, fatal shall be the stroke which Satan shall receive from Christ, though it is probable he did not understand the nature and the extent of his doom. From the very beginning, God, instead of wiping out all of humanity, and he would have been just to do so, he would have been just in his own creation to just remove humanity from the picture after the first sin, but instead, he says, I've actually developed a solution for this. In the future, the Christ will come and he will crush the serpent. The mercy of God was evident at the beginning towards humanity. The ability, like, like Zach said during communion, the ability to forgive men of sin could only come from God. And as we move further through the Old Testament, we see people that recognize the mercy of God. We see people that understand God's characteristic and they choose to act it out. And we see this through the prophets of the Old Testament. As, as, as modern day readers of the Bible, we have the luxury of the understanding of when we read the scripture that these, these characters, these people of the Bible are in here for a reason. And they're in here because they're doing something that's, that's usually um, pretty unique. It makes them stand out. But at the time that it was happening, the prophets probably felt really singled out in what they were doing because they were assigned to sometimes go to their own nation and say, you're not acting like you're God's chosen people. Start acting like it. Or sometimes they would even have to go to a foreign nation and say, this is not what God requires. Start acting like you were made by God. God wants you. And so the Old Testament prophets really seemed like they were lonely acting out like they were alone, maybe even misunderstood and oftentimes unwelcomed. And one of these people is Elijah. And this is where our 2 Kings passage is going to come in. 2 Kings chapter 6. This is one of my favorite passages, actually. 2 Kings chapter 6. And we're going to read verse 8 to verse 23. It says this in the New King James. Now the king of Syria 
was making war against Israel. And he, uh, he consulted within his servants, saying, my camp will be in such and such a place. And the man of God, remember that title, the man of God, sent to the king of Israel, saying, beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down there. Then the king of Israel sent someone to that place of which the man of God had told him. Thus he warned him, and he was watchful there not just once or twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me which one of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord. O king, but Elijah, the prophet, who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. So he said, go and see where he is, that I may send and get him. And it was told him, saying, surely he's in Dothan. Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there. And they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And the servant said to him, alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, do not fear, for those who are with us are more than they are with them. And Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open the eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of, of chariots and horses, a fire all around Elijah. So when the Syrians came down to him, Elijah prayed to the Lord and said, strike these people with blindness, I pray. And the Lord did so according to the word of Elijah, he struck the people with blindness. Now Elijah said to them, this is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me and I'll bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria. So it was when they had came to Samaria that Elijah said to the Lord, open these men's eyes that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they saw that they were now in Samaria. And when the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elijah, my father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? But he answered, you shall not kill them. Would you kill them who you have taken captive by bow and sword? Set food before them, set water before them, that they may eat and drink and go to their master. Then they prepared a great feast for them. And after they ate and drank, he sent them away to their masters. So this band of Syrian raiders came no more into the land of Israel. The title that's associated with Elijah here is the man of God. He has an identity, somebody that he belongs to, God. And therefore, everything that he does is a representation of what God would allegedly approve based on what the people see about Elijah. His title, man of God, is very specific here. But he's also known as the prophet of Israel. He knows what nation he belongs to. The one that claims to be God's own people. And this man can tell even the most private things of the enemy to the king. And when he's finally exposed, a great army is coming down to take Elisha captive. But when this happens, Elijah notices, I've got an entire army of God that can surround them. He has them right in their hand. And just when the very people that could have taken Elijah captive are at his disposal, instead of calling down the Lord's army to them right in his hand, he instead asks them to have blindness. And then he does something really interesting again. And as he goes down to them and says, I'm not the person that you're looking for, but I can take you to where I am because this isn't the right city. And somehow he convinces an entire blind army to follow him to a whole nother city. And he brings him inside of Samaria. And now the army is again surrounded by Israel. The second time they were at Elijah's disposal, right in his hand was his enemy. And when the king asked, can I kill them? Can I dispose of our enemy that torments us? The second time Elijah says, no. Instead, give them food, give them water, and send them home. Instead of exercising judgment right on his enemy right then, he shows them mercy, gives them food, gives them water, sends them home. And the conclusion of this chapter is the Syrian raiders decide, we're actually not going to go back and raid Syria, or we're not going to go raid Israel anymore. Elijah shows the mercy of his God to his enemy. 
Even all the way before, we have the teaching of Paul in Romans chapter 12, where he says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink. For in doing so, you will reap coals of fire upon his head. And then Paul follows that up with, but don't overcome evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. That teaching still had yet to come out of Paul's mouth, but he's actually even quoting the proverb that says the exact same thing. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him water. In doing so, you will reap coals of fire on his head. But the writer of the proverb says after that, and the Lord will see that and reward you. Even before those teachings had come about, Elijah got it. He said, you know what? I know the God that I serve. I would rather show mercy, so I will feed my enemy. I will give them something to drink. In fact, he, it says he gives them a great feast before he sends them home. The man of God accurately represents his identity in God as created in humanity. And moving even further into the Old Testament, we have King David that does the exact same thing. David writes in his Psalm, Psalm 109, 26 and 27, he says, help me, O Lord, my God. O save me according to your mercy, that they may know that it is your hand, that you, Lord, have done it. David knows the mercy will come from God, and I will also show mercy. In 1 Samuel, chapter 24 and 26, David does this thing also twice. He has King Saul right in his hand, and he could have killed him. In the latter chapter, he's standing over him with a javelin, and he could have just stuck him right there while he was asleep, but he didn't. He showed mercy instead. The very person that was coming to kill him, he didn't take advantage of, because David knows, Lord, I need your mercy, and you've saved me. I should do the same thing. David, a man after God's own heart, just like Elijah, they're both associated as a person of God, a man of God. Both of them twice show the mercy of God. And both of them twice overcome evil with good. What better representation could we have of God showing us to love mercy than his very own people? As Christians, we bear the name of God. We bear the name of Jesus Christ. God has shown us what is good. What is the expectation of us? Go ahead and turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to be reading there also. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, um, we're going to start up in verse 17. It says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This message here, the ministry of reconciliation, being created in Christ Jesus follows a very similar narrative of Genesis, created by God, and now we have a responsibility given by God placed in us. Paul says here, we have the ministry, the word of reconciliation. We are the ones that deliver and represent what Christ has done for us. And in the same way, we plead to you, be reconciled to God. This is our responsibility. This is our task. And then he moves further down and says, we are ambassadors of God. 
An ambassador represents like a company or like a nation, and everything that that ambassador does represents the person that sent them. As ambassadors of Christ, everything that we do is a representation of who we are as Christians. We represent God. Whether we do something that's good or do something that's bad, that's how people will say that must be how God is. That must be who Christ is. That must be how churches are. That must be how Christians are. So it's important that we remember, well, our trespasses were forgiven us by God, the one that placed mercy inside of us. We should forgive. We should show mercy. We should accurately be ambassadors of Jesus Christ. And he says something very similar in Ephesians 2.10. Ephesians 2.10 says this, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Another similar parallel to the creation narrative, we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. In the beginning, when God created humanity, he deemed humanity good. We were created for good works. In the beginning, God prepared man in advance to accurately, accurately represent his image and his likeness. We've been prepared in advance for the good work that God has assigned to us. We've been given the Holy Spirit even. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22, we have the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Fruit, singular. Everything in there in Galatians 5, 22, love, joy, peace, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, is all encompassed in the Holy Spirit. And that very thing has been placed inside of us. And if it's been placed inside of us by God, if we have a piece of God inside of us, what does God expect out of us? The exact same thing that he's placed inside of us. Love, mercy. I also want to note that in the beginning, when God created humanity and he made them good, man chose to adopt sin but that didn't remove the expectation of humanity. That didn't remove the expectation to still be good, to still represent God in his likeness, in his image. And the same thing for us. We're created in Christ Jesus, but when we adopt sin, the expectation still remains. We hold to Christ. We are his image, and we are to love mercy. So all the way back in Micah chapter 6, verse 8, he has shown you, oh man, he has absolutely shown us all the way from the beginning and creation, the very first revelation of Jesus, all the way back to the beginning, through the Old Testament into the New Testament, the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15 with Jesus Christ, all the way to now. He has shown us what is good. What does the Lord require of us but to do justly? to love mercy and to walk humbly before your God. Before we close out, I want to back up to, to our passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And the reason for that is if, if you haven't been baptized, then you, you haven't obtained that mercy of God. So I'll offer you the same message that Paul does to the Corinthians. Be reconciled to God. God has you right in his hand, and he could accurately and righteously exercise judgment, but he prefers mercy, as we've seen. He prefers mercy so much that in verse 21 he says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. In him. So if you're waiting for that moment of, of, is this the right time? Do I need to be baptized? Is, is, the, is this the call for God? This is it right here. I'll give it to you right now. And, and I know we're in an interesting season. A lot of you are here. A lot of you are out there. I'm talking to you. So this is the same message for you. And it's just as easy for somebody here as you are out there to get a hold of somebody if you need something. Be reconciled to God. Be baptized and obtain that mercy that God so eagerly desires to show 
to us. And for us, when we have the opportunity to so show judgment, that's the perfect opportunity to exercise mercy, the very thing God has placed inside of us. Love mercy. I thank you for your time.